Hi, my name is Mike Dillard, and this is a Self Made Man, the podcast for those who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of your life. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. If you've been a listener of the show for a while, you know that I've had plans to launch an apparel line for Self Made Man here in the coming year. So first and foremost, why do I think that it's an important step to take for my business and for yours as well? Well, I'm of the opinion that great brands stand for something that's far bigger than their product or service. They stand for a set of beliefs, of values, or a way of looking at the world. Your biggest fans want to live that message, and wearing a specific brand's clothing becomes a part of the way they get to identify their values to others and express themselves. But this is certainly not a case of build it and they will come. When it comes to clothing, there's definitely an intangible cool factor that has to be captured. So how do you do that? How do you create a brand that people will want to wear? Well, to help us crack that code, we're joined by Chris Dramapath, the founder of Young and Reckless Apparel. So Chris has a hell of a story, and he's managed to grow Young and Reckless to more than $30 million in annual revenue. And today, he's here to decode this industry for you and I from beginning to end. We're going to talk about creating a brand that people care about, where to get your apparel designed and printed, how to test which designs will sell best before purchasing inventory, and even how to market your brand on social media, which was an extremely valuable portion of this episode with strategies and tactics personally that I've never heard of before. You'll even find out why he suddenly became the target of the Hells Angels biker gang thanks to a horrible mistake made by one of his designers. So if you want to learn how to take your brand to the next level, this is an episode you will not want to miss. So please help me welcome Chris Path. Well, Chris, welcome to Self Made Man. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Thanks for having me, man. I'm excited. Absolutely, brother. So I'm extremely excited about this interview for one particular reason, and the fact that your area of expertise and the company that you built happens to be in an area which is uh, apparel that I have (laughs) attempted to get into and to incorporate into my business for, gosh, five or six years unsuccessfully. So having an opportunity to er learn some wisdom from you on this topic today to me is just priceless. So thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, I'm an open book, man. I'll give you anything I know. I've had a lot of of failures too, but I'll try to to give you you everything I got. Well, your company is Young and Reckless and... Last year, uh, at least what I've seen on you know Forbes and whatnot, you guys did about thirty-one million dollars in revenue, which is absolutely awesome. But you have yeah. a pretty fascinating story as to how you actually started the company. So, for those who are not familiar with that, who haven't heard it before, could we spend a few minutes diving back into that and maybe even just start with your experience uh, going through a coma? I think would be a would be an interesting story to hear as well. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it has a lot of twists and turns and a lot of... So I'll give you kind of the overview and then if there's anything specific, feel free to ask. But I you know, I grew up in Akron, Ohio, and it's a pretty, you know, boring, not to be negative about it, but there's not a lot going on, not a lot of opportunity, not a lot of sort of expectations. And I mean that in a bad way. Like you're just kind of raised to understand that you're probably going to marry someone from your high school you're probably going to work at your parents' work or maybe, you know, one of the local businesses. And that's pretty much going to be your life. Pop out a few kids and then repeat the cycle. So that's kind of what it's like there. And I grew up skateboarding. I was insanely passionate about it. That's all I did every day, all day. And so naturally, my first goal in life was to be a professional skateboarder. So I dedicated my whole life to it. I would say around 16, being honest, around 16 is when I started to realize like, I'm just not good enough. Like, I just don't have the gift. I'm not going to be a professional skateboarder. It wasn't this like devastating moment, but it just led me to start drifting into, um, like I was filming and I was taking photos and I became like the filmer of the group. So actually one of the ways that I funded my trip to California was I made a skateboard video of all of the best kids in Akron. And then I had a big premiere for it. I learned how to edit on my, uh, on my Mac. And I, and I went around to all those skate shops like in Cleveland and in all the surrounding cities. And I sold them the video, hyping it up. You know, that was before YouTube, before any of that stuff. So I hyped it up on um, here. You know, you can check out what the Akron kids are doing. And you can get a little, you know, glimpse into what's going on down in Akron. And 
So I made a couple thousand dollars off of that. Are you burning these DVDs yourself? Yeah. Yeah, I remember yeah. those days. So I, uh, those were good old days. Yeah. It was, <laughs> oh man, I felt like I was like a technical wizard. Like, you know, like I edited this 30 minute video. I was printing DVDs. I went and did a crappy photo shoot with all the kids that were in it. And I made the covers, you know, I ordered the blank sleeves. Like I really felt like I was like killing it. So yes, yeah, so that's what I did. It was called point blank. And I went and sold it and made a couple thousand bucks, which once again, to, to me then that was like, $2 million now, you know, like I was, I was rich. And so anyway, so here, here was the plan. As soon as I turned 18, I was going to graduate, graduate high school. And then a month later, I was going to move to LA. And a week after my graduation, I fell skating, uh, hit my head. I don't remember anything. All I remember is eating breakfast that morning and waking up four days later. And it turned out I fractured my skull. I had some pretty severe, uh, brain bleeding multiple concussions from my brain sort of bouncing around in my, in, in my skull and, uh, you know, messed me up pretty good. So I had a blood clot in my brain from the skull fracture. And so I wasn't allowed to leave. And when I woke up, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't read. I couldn't taste food. I didn't know how to use my beloved, uh, back. Like I just didn't know how to do anything. It was really weird. And it, and it took a little bit, but that came back. And so I couldn't move. So I was devastated because my whole life plan was to move to LA the moment I graduated. So getting to the point, finally by November, the blood clot still hadn't left. I kept getting CAT scans every month. And they said, you know what? We think at this point, if it would have caused a problem, it would have by now you'd be having seizures or whatever. You can go ahead and go. And if anything happens, you know, we'll deal with it. And so I took off to LA and thank God nothing ever happened. There was never any, uh, any problems. So anyway, then came to LA, ended up by chance connecting with my cousin, who is now the superstar Rob Dyrdek. He was talking about shooting the pilot for a new MTV show. The thoughts of that were like, I can't even explain what it would be like today. It'd be like accidentally becoming friends with Elon Musk and him telling you that he's going to take you to Mars next year. <laughs> um, and, and it worked. And it became this hit TV show, uh, Robin Big. And I know I'm covering a lot of ground here, but to get to the clothing part, you know, I, it was great. And we became like, people recognized us overnight and we had all of this attention and it was so crazy, but our goal and my goal especially was to always figure out a way to create a real life off of that. I knew that that wasn't real life. And I knew that I didn't want to be a reality star and go do club appearances for a living for the rest of my life. So it was trying to figure out how to create a business and, that show turned into another hit show called Fantasy Factory. And really what I did was I said, who are we marketing, you know, directly to? And the stars aligned. I mean, I'm going to be honest. Like, I, I consider myself a smart guy, but I'm not like, I'm not some super genius. Really what happened was we were marketing directly to this kind of 14 to 22 male demographic. There happened to be a direct chain of retail, uh, multiple ones that catered to them being Paxson Tilly Zoomies clothing was the perfect thing. I could wear it on the show. They could go get it the next day. All of those things lined up. I came up with the name Young and Reckless and it was kind of off to the races a little bit it quickly. You know, it, right. it went really fast. Awesome. You've you had a, an audience. Yeah. Ready and waiting. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's where, you know, uh, the cool thing is now, you know, I do think it's, it's the same. It's almost better. You know, you have an audience ready and waiting on for an e-com store, you know, but um, it's a different strategy, a different way of building it. But yeah, I, it was ready and waiting. Like we literally timed it so that the first shipment to PacSun was on the floors the day after the first episode about me starting a company aired. So the next morning when every kid walked into the mall to get their new clothes, there's the brand that they just saw be built on TV last night. It just worked really well. Awesome. You know, how did that feel to have that kind of revenue and, and sales numbers coming in? I don't know about you, but, you know, I've had an online business now for 10 or 12 years. And when you have a promotion going on or a sale, there's no better feeling than just sitting there hitting the refresh button, you know, on your stats. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, it was, it was, I mean, euphoric. I don't, I mean, and I'll be just really transparent about it. It was like, you launch it. Keep in mind, I, I came from a place where $2,000 was, you know, was rich. And so, you know, I think the first year we did probably three or $4 million in sales. 
And then the next year we went to eight and then the next year, you know, like it was quick and the margins were insane because we weren't spending a crazy amount of marketing dollars and we were selling a lot of printable t-shirts and printable items and the margins on those are just insane. So yeah, I mean, it took a couple years, but it was, you know, I mean, when you're making millions of dollars, it's like, holy crap. Like I am the king of the world. You know, I thought I was like the world's greatest uh, businessman. Did you, uh, you know, how old were you at this time? I would say when it really started like working, I was probably like, you know, 24. Did you go, did you go like blow the money on, on something fun that a yeah. 24 year old would do? Yeah. What was <laughs> Absolutely. that? Absolutely. All types of things. I, for my uh, 26th birthday, I bought a Lamborghini. Nice. Like the classic, classic, like just signed my record deal move. I had a Rolls Royce for a little bit. I had, you know, I, I had Rolexes and, and, you know, the one thing that I will say is I always had this instinct to stay focused. Like I wasn't taking crazy trips. I wasn't partying. I was, you know, that's never been my thing. And I think that definitely kind of kept me on track, you know, but I mm. definitely had like my, my rapper, all my rapper dreams. Uh, came through, you know. <laughs> I think it's a phase you've got to go through, you know, at least to experience you got it. To. Yeah, and then you watch. You know, and I'll, I'll be honest. One of my one of my pieces of advice for young people is like, you know, I think that as you get older and a little bit more mature, sometimes you look back on some of those things and you're like, God, oh, that was so stupid. Like, what was the point of a Lamborghini? Like it, those things, you can't even drive it, you know. But I do think like you got to do it. Like you got to go through it. You got to uh, enjoy it when you're young. If you, if you're fortunate enough to have that opportunity, you got to take advantage of it and then worry about being you know, responsible and mature later. Cause there's agreed. plenty of time. For that. Agreed. Agreed. So let's dive in real quick and, and unpack this industry, if you will, because it's something that I yeah. really don't understand. And I have a, a good friend of mine. She started a essentially an Italian handbag line last year from scratch. She's never done this before, but she's yep. very talented, has a great eye for design, flew to Italy, picked out the best materials, made, you know, three or 400 bags. And she was asking me for marketing advice at some point. And I'm just like, I have no idea how you would market a apparel product who, whose value is, you know, to potential customers subjective based on how they associate with the brand, right? There's millions of bags, yeah. but why would they pick yours and spend $1,500 oh, yeah. on a bag, right? So if you could, let's just talk about the uh, the apparel industry and, and selling it and marketing it from a 50,000 foot view, and we'll go from there. Yeah, so here's the big thing, which is kind of a crappy answer, but I deal with this answer every day, is in apparel especially, especially in 2017, there are no rules whatsoever. Like there are brands even now, you know, that are doing 30, 40, 40 million dollars in revenue just based off of a cool Instagram following. I mean, there's vloggers who are doing 30 million in revenue on merch based off of their vlog following on YouTube only, which I still don't understand. So that's the unfortunate news is like there is no rules or sort of blueprint. Now, that's also the fun part because you can try anything and anything is possible. You just have to be really aggressive and also really realistic with yourself. You know, try something aggressive. If it doesn't work, you have to move on quickly. But I would say the kind of the 50,000 is you need to understand who your audience is. Do they even exist? And be realistic. Who are they? Who are the competitors in also gunning for that audience? And what are they doing? And then how are you, you know, how are you marketing to them? If your handbags are $1,500, you need to have a story that's believable about why it's worth paying $1,500. It could be where they're made and it's the finest of quality uh, things better than anything else and you can't beat it. And it has to be the best or the feeling that it gives you is worth the $1,500 or the love that went into this. You know, like it really, you have to tell that story and you have to make it worth it. You can't just say where a lot of people go wrong is they say, well, you know, I'll make it 1500 bucks. They look really nice. They're made in Italy. People will pay it. And it's just not true. You become delusional because you fall in love so much with your own product that you think a stranger will love it just as much and they just don't care. So I think it's similar to the lesson I learned early. It's about what's your product? Who's your audience? How are you going to 
is there even a space for it? How are you going to tell that story? And then, you know, just doing that to the fullest force to try to make a real impact and try to get people's attention. Right. Yeah, absolutely agreed. That's one of the things that we, we spent weeks on was who is your ideal customer avatar essentially and what kind yeah. of feelings do they want and what's the story of how, you know, this bag was made. And I, that's something I learned, gosh, I think in, in college or out, outside of college when I needed to give a gift to someone and I'll always wrote, I don't know where I got the idea from, but I wanted to give them a bottle of wine, but who cares? It's just a bottle of wine, right? You walk into a store, yeah. there's 500 of them to choose from. But I spent a few hours looking up the story of the vineyard, the winemaker, the land, the region, and I wrote this two-page story about the wine and where it came from and how it was made and the people and included that. And now that is that person's yeah. favorite bottle of wine, <laughs> right? Exactly. Um, Exactly. It's so true. I mean, think about it like buying a gift for your girlfriend or wife, right? If you go buy her a teddy bear and let's say a bottle of wine and say, hey, happy Valentine's Day, it's going to be like, oh, thanks, babe. You know, you thought about me. But like, if you go do something that has meaning or, you know, you, you drove to this place where you got her favorite, it could be like a fraction of the price. It's not about the price. It's about like the thought that went into it. And now that's going to mean something for the rest of of that person's life. And most of the things that mean so much, not to get too deep, but mean so much to people are the things that have stories, not the things that have price tags. Right. And that's essentially what you're doing. You know, you're trying to connect with people through a product and it's not easy, you know? So, you know, we've got self-made man. It's a growing brand. My goal is to turn it into a big brand and we focus on online education as our primary product. But I believe that it's really important to give you're essentially fans and customers the opportunity to live the brand on a daily basis and to express that, right? And so apparel's a fantastic, yep. ideal way to do that. The problem is, and I think, and the reason I wanted to make this the topic of today's episode is that I believe all of the entrepreneurs out there are going to think about doing this at one time or another in their business, right? And yep. so you get online and you type in custom logoed hats or shirts or whatever, uh, you know, wholesale. And you can find a dozen different vendors that will give you a catalog of all of these essentially blank hats or shirts and they'll do whatever they, you know, you want done to it. Put your logo on there, whatever. And now essentially you've got apparel. But the problem is that's just your typical generic swag, right? It's not unique. It's yeah. not super special outside of your logo. And I really aspire to design and sell the clothes that I would want to personally wear. So... That is something I don't know how to do. Like, how how did you guys start Young and Reckless? Where do you go to get your custom stuff designed and your hoodies, right? So that it's y'all's clothing, not blanks that you're buying. And I know that is I know that is the case for some of the items, but not all of them, right? So I guess that's yeah, where yeah. I'd love to start. Yeah, here's what I'd say. Like, what we did really well, and, and we're very fortunate to be able to do, but I would suggest it to everyone is... The most important thing is the brand, right? Because there's not really anything that either of us are going to do that's going to change the fashion game, you know, or that somebody else isn't already doing. And we're also never going to be able to compete with the prices of, let's say, H&M or Topshop or those guys. So being that the brand is most important, I think the first kind of obstacle is how do you get people to wear just the T-shirts? You know, like how do you get them to subscribe to the brand and the brand makes them feel such a way that they they would rather have your t-shirt over the millions and millions and millions of other options. And I think that's a good kind of exercise, right? Because that will show if your brand and your message is really resonating or not. So for all, especially young people trying to start brands, I would say that's like challenge number one. As you go and progress, like what we did is we had money coming in from the printables, which were pretty easy. You know, we had a team of graphic designers, maybe two kids. And as that money started coming in, we just started hiring more advanced designers from that had came from other brands or other companies, and they knew what to do. Now, the trick for us was always finding a designer who understood not only good designs, but, but cost. And that's, those are two totally different things. You'll have a designer that'll come in and design a really incredible jacket, but the cost to make it is there's no chance. you know. And when you really find someone who understands pricing and how much stuff is going to take to produce and also how to 
give kind of give kind of perceived value. You know, it's a difference of where you're putting zippers and how you're putting buttons. And those little things with a real designer make a world of difference because something can seem really expensive, but be really inexpensive to actually make. So if you kind of ride that journey into finding the right talent, but also once again, for young people and for startups, like you can get really resourceful and there's a lot of people making really good, you know, even there's stuff on Alibaba, there's stuff, there's stuff everywhere where people are making really good, really cool stuff. That's essentially blanks, you know, it's pre-made, but nobody would ever know it, you know, and you put your logo on it and it looks like, Oh man, what designer did this? You know, it's, it's, Pretty interesting how how cool you can get by digging around in some of those places. Nice. What kind of pricing do you feel is necessary in order to, to have enough margin to grow a business? So we go low, right? My goal is to, now it's, that's once again that's all strategy, you know. But my goal is when I first started Young and Reckless, here was kind of my business mission statement: was streetwear is so cool in New York, LA, Miami, major cities, but it's not available to kids in Ohio, like where I'm from. And when you come out to LA, you see people lined around the block to buy a $40 Gildan t-shirt with a graphic on it. And it's like, what, how is that even possible? And so my goal was, I want to take that streetwear feeling and I want to give it to the masses. I want it sold in malls. I want whatever, but I want the branding to be so good that people still feel connected with it. Now, my shirts were $24.99, so a little cheaper, but that was sort of the plan. The problem now is that no longer exists. That plan no longer exists. You can go online, you can order Supreme, you can order any of these cool streetwear, but the coolest streetwear brands, no matter where you live, so the model is now dead, not to mention that a lot of streetwear brands opened up and did mall uh, distribution shortly after we did. So here's the pivot. What happened is you're not going to, like I said, I can't beat H&M, Topshop. I can't beat those guys. Uniqlo, they all came here and really expanded in the U.S. just after Young and Reckless started. And they're doing such a good job. I mean, kids can look like their favorite artist or athlete or whoever they want for for 20 bucks, you know, you can buy a lot of clothes at those stores and I will, I just won't be able to hit those prices. So what I'm trying to do is essentially be 20% more, 15% more in cost, but have a brand associated with it and have some meaning. And that's the reason why you're going to pick Young and Reckless over H&M or some unbranded, nothing with no feelings. So to answer your question, it's all strategy. We do denim. We just started doing denim. It's two for seventy dollars. You know, we'll do a pack of t-shirts. We just started graphic t-shirts, which used to be in the mall for twenty four ninety nine, are now two for thirty. We'll do three extended, like long fashion t-shirts for twenty bucks. You know, we just have all of these deals. We're trying to really do deals and sell stories in our deals with keeping our healthy margin. I mean, we would do really good at margin, but you know, also e-com has allowed us, given us some room to play with there. So it's just evolved, but that's our strategy. We go for affordable. How do you test the designs, right? For example, you could have three hats designed that have three different color schemes. And do you throw those out there out there first to get pre-orders? And I'm saying like, do you order 100 of each or 3,000 of each because one of them is going to outsell the rest, right? There's going to be one that people like the most. Is there a strategy or methodology you guys use for testing? Yeah. So I would say across the board, our entire business is kind of a balance between chasing what works, you know, sort of preserving the core of the brand with, you know, what is steady and then dumping or bailing out of what's bad. And I would say that the easiest way to put it is like, we always order relatively conservatively. We've had some misses on both sides. I mean, we've had some misses where we went big on something and we were wrong. Girls swim the first year we did it. The marketing story wasn't there. It just wasn't there. And we went big on it and we were wrong. And we had a lot of inventory. Also, we've went soft. Men's denim, we thought there was no chance it was going to work. We ordered light and it was it exploded and was gone instantly and it takes a long time to make denim and we didn't have any more to order and lost a lot of dollars there so it's constantly like we everything's a little conservative in the beginning but we chase really really aggressively if something looks like it's taken off we will go we will go so hard on the next order and if something isn't right we bail quickly mm, that makes sense so yeah 
if we were going to do something that wasn't off the shelf, right? And and let's just say we wanted to do a hoodie with some kind of customized feature on it, whether it's a zipper or a seam or whatever, something that's custom. You have the designer create it, and then are there apparel essentially makers in in Asia that you just submit the design to and you can order them? What does that process look like? Yep. So that's a, another whole other ball game all on its own, and. Once again, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. I would say the absolute best way is built on relationships. It's built on a lot of trips to China, a lot of trips all around to find the vendors. What you're looking for is a vendor who understands your brand and what you're trying to accomplish because a lot of stuff can get lost in translation mm. and you'll get your first samples back and they are just nowhere close because that vendor might not make that type of clothing normally, right? And then there's certain vendors that can just hit prices that will give you good prices. And maybe they have leftover fabric from a massive Forever 21 order, or maybe they have, you know, so if you find these vendors that usually have a lot of materials on hand, know pricing, know the game and know how to make really good clothes. Now you found yourself a good vendor and that's the one that you want to work with. The trick is that's all a process of its own. And that's all something that you have to go through and meet these people and go through 20 bad ones to find the one good one. And um, it's a huge, huge, huge piece of the puzzle. A lot, a lot of brands have been sunk by bad vendors, bad production, and not understanding that piece of the business, you know. Are there trade shows here in the U.S. that you would recommend going to to meet these vendors? So, yes and no. I We haven't had too much luck at trade shows really in general but especially for vendors i don't it just seems like you got to go over there you got to meet them you got to build the relationships and and one of the big problems too is all the good vendors it's hard to get the really good vendor to work with a new up and coming brand that wants 200 pieces of something right because it's right. not worth their time it's not worth the setup you know they want a commitment of 5000 10000 units and so that's where you have this kind of tricky predicament. I don't know why we haven't had, like, I just think that maybe it's too easy to say you could walk around a trade show in Vegas and, and meet the best vendor. Like, I think maybe that's just too good to be true, but for some reason it comes from going over there or, or having good contact, good people that are in clothing that can hook you up with. Like if you said, Hey man, I'm really trying to get this jacket made. I don't know how to do it. I just need 200 pieces. Like I could give you someone that did it, right? So based off of relationships, you don't have to fly to China to figure right. out how to make sure <laughs> right, right. But in general, trade shows are tough, man. I, I think even the the trade shows for buyers and you know for trying to sell products are, are pretty much dead. The only thing that's really interesting, it's out of the production lane, but the only thing that's really interesting in trade show world is what they're doing with Complex Con, which is consumer facing. You can sell product. You can market your brand. There's a concert. There's all this stuff going on. I mean, that's really the future, I think. From a from a, a shopping experience, an e-commerce experience, are there anything are there any things that y'all have been testing or doing that you feel is kind of pushing the envelope? And and one of the things that I'll just throw out there that I would be thinking about if you don't do it already is making sure that you are set up for Apple Pay, right? So that these these kids can be going through Instagram, see your post, your ad, whatever, swipe up to go to the checkout page for that particular backpack or shirt, and then you know they're one thumbprint away from purchasing. Right? Have you all started messing with anything in that world yet? So the biggest thing is, you know, Instagram now lets you for certain accounts. It's it's a Shopify add-on, right? So it has to be through Shopify, but you can actually tag a photograph with. The, you know, like if you press it, like, a, like you're looking for who's tagged in it, mm. it'll show you the actual items, the prices, and it'll take you to that item. Nice. Uh, which is really, really cool. I'm going to be honest, though. We haven't seen as much good reaction on that as you think that you would. Like when you see it on our page, you're like, holy cow, they must just be printing money off of that thing. But it's not <laughs> really, you know, I don't know what it is, but there's something that needs worked out there, right? I think to be really honest, I think there's a lot you can do with, with that sort of stuff. But the real thing that we're focusing on that's so important is content and how you really get people actually engaged with your brand. It's like these days, people, even with one Instagram scroll, you have so many people marketing to you and so many options, so many things to buy. 
no matter how savvy you get, I just don't think you're going to have this crazy growth unless you're actually making people engage with the brand more and like the brand more and give the brand more meaning. And that's where I think a lot of people are going wrong. They're focusing a lot on fun. Like I said, on these like savvy sort of tricks or, or just bettering those little tiny things and not focusing on what the brand actually stands for and how you have a voice through all of the noise, you know, how are you guys, how are you guys fighting that? So we're just trying to really put out the most content possible and really connect with the audience. I've always been a very big believer that especially in apparel, you know, the, the product comes after the content or the product comes after the media. You know, it's like you buy, you buy something, you buy an item to remind you how a piece of content made you feel. Whether that content is like, I mean, like walking through Disneyland and stopping at the gift shop. You're stopping at the gift shop because of how you felt walking through Disneyland or watching a movie and buying merch or going to a show and buying merch. It's all, it always follows. And so we're really trying to, you know, I, I do a podcast also called Short Story Long, and it's all about young, successful people that have kind of made their own way. And, you know, that's the spirit of young and reckless, right? This person has done their own thing and here's how they did it. And you can do it too. And I want to empower people and, and make them feel feel special from watching that and want a piece of the clothing to kind of go along with that. I just started a YouTube series uh, with my business partner called Group Chat, where we really break down what's going on in the industry, new brands, what people are doing right and wrong. Uh, I'm working on a video blog series. It's just all these things to really try to try to connect with that audience, with the, with the reality of what we really are and who we are and what we stand for. And I think that the customer will follow that. You know, what's interesting, I, I came across uh, a month or two ago, you've, you've probably heard of them as well, but uh, the coffee company, Black Rifle Coffee. Have you seen their stuff yeah, on I've YouTube? I've heard of yet? it, but I'm just not very familiar with it. No, I haven't. So, they finally, they've been out for a couple of years, but they finally caught my attention a couple of months ago uh, with a particular video that mm -hmm. I saw. And so, I, I tapped into their YouTube channel and I literally spent probably an hour going through almost every single video they've made and they've got 60 or 70 and yeah. it's freaking brilliant because they're funny they're entertaining they're edgy they're all about their brand they're speaking exactly to their target audience which is you know very military-esque yeah. that world that community and it's just amazing i'm like oh my gosh this is what we need to be doing because that's all they're doing is creating media that their followers love, that it is engaging and captivating, and it's creating goodwill for the brand, right? Which then sells coffee. I'm going to look them up because it's just, you can tell when you see somebody doing it right, you're like, oh man, that's it. Like yep. they did it. You know, like you just feel it. And we watch, I don't know if you've seen Purple Mattress, like the stuff that they do. They do mm -hmm. these really funny skits. And we're trying to do more stuff like that too. Even how uh, Dollar Shave Club felt in the beginning it just felt connected, you know, and I think that's the goal. Right. It's, it's, you know, the first Black Rifle videos followed the Dollar Shave Club format, right? They've got a couple of those, yeah. but they've just kept expanding. And it's like, they've got to have a whole media department where their only goal is to like make a really hilarious freaking video once a week. And they have, you know, yeah. hundreds of thousands, if not millions of views. And it just completely sets them apart from any other coffee company out there. Yeah, it's so cool, man. I, I'm a big fan of it. And I would say like, in all companies, like in all apparel companies in any similar space to this, like and this is what happened to ours is you, essentially you should be getting rid of your sales team and adding a media team in their place. Exactly. You know, you should be clearing out their desks, using that office. Uh, you don't need to worry about having this. You used to have to have a 10 person or more sales team talking to retailers all day, traveling around, showing the product, going to all the trade shows. Those people should literally be slowly clearing out and be replaced with young, smart kids with Canon 5Ds and Final Cut uh, because that <laughs> is, you know, that's the magic. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, we're, we're looking at building, building a little group like that and sending them all over the country and the world to, to make little movies and document stuff that they find inspiring and inspiring people. And, and uh, I, I completely agree with you on that. Yeah. You've got cool. another interesting story that I want to tap into real quick. And let's just say it's a lesson learned potentially in copyright slash trademark. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> On what not like to do. <laughs> how, yeah. did, how did that happen? What's the story there? Well, which one are we talking about? Are we talking about Hell's Angels? Yeah. Or are we talking about... Yeah. Oh, Hell's man, Angels that one. one I I'm, I'm, 
scared to even say the word. Like, I feel like <laughs> they're so good. They're going to like know that I was talking about them and show up at my door. Um, really what happened was they, so that was a great lesson learned. And we've had a couple, you know, we've had a few issues, obviously small things. And then also we've, we've benefited from a few, like we've had forever 21 selling shirts that say straight up young and reckless on them. We've had Walmart selling reckless and young and reckless sweatpants. And then obviously all the way down to like your huts that are selling product on Myrtle Beach have done it too, which is cool. Cool to see and cool to sort of learn how that goes and how to track them down and how to handle it. But definitely the best story one is our Hells Angels run-in. So really what happened was we had a team of, you know, three or four graphic designers. It was relatively early, probably three years into the business. And I was running the business as well as filming the MTV show Fantasy Factory. And so the way it would work is before every season, I would get a box of samples of the t-shirts that were going to be coming out when the show aired. So let's say it's like a five month sort of lead time, right? So I'd get a box of all these shirts. I knew these are the ones I'm going to wear. And then when the show airs, they'll all be in stores. So I had this one shirt and it looked like I thought it was sort of like a Guns N' Roses inspired mm. graphic. So not only was I not nearly as savvy then to what potential red flags are, but uh, I just didn't think it was a big deal. I thought it was an original graphic, but I thought it just had that kind of crest look to it from, uh, from Guns N' Roses. So word on TV, word all over TV. I mean, I had a print of it behind my desk on the show. So every time you came into my office, there's our little <laughs> graphic that we love so much. And it turns out the designer had simply taken the Hells Angels logo and wrote reckless youth instead of Hells Angels and then put a bandana over the skull face, like literally made next to no changes. So obviously you're just screwed. And well, what, those what, guys what, what are, happens? Is that a knock on the door or is that a phone call from an attorney or is that a pissed off biker? Like, how does that? Oh, shit. It was all the above, man. <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> it was, it was, uh, so let me just say, I wore it all over the show. I did all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. I think that the first contact was the moment that it aired. It actually aired on TV, me wearing it. And I think that people started just blowing me up on social media, I think first. And saying, man, what are you doing? And, and I will tell you, there is no brand, no group, no nothing as diligent with their trademarks <laughs> as the Hells Angels. I mean, they know where it is. They will hunt you down. They will get their money. They will find it. So, so I believe social media. And I was like, oh, no. And so I did the classic Google search. It's the exact thing. I'm like, oh, my gosh, my life is over. Then you get the official attorney letter. Yeah. Then you get like friends telling you that, you know, weird friends that are far removed, but are, but happen to be friends with Hell's Angels saying you're screwed. Like they are going to come beat you up. I just want you to know, like there's a group in San Diego. There's one in San Bernardino. Like they want to beat you up all the way down to one night, literally walking out of a bar in LA and a guy coming up to me and saying, Hey man, you better be a lot more careful about what you're putting on your t-shirts and kind of, you know, being a little aggressive yeah. and, uh, and every angle, every different way that you could say that that wasn't okay, they, they definitely use, except for actually punching me in the face, which I, I uh, thankful. <laughs> right. So what was the conversation like with the designer? Who oh, it? man, it was bad. It was bad. Yeah, it was, it was pretty much the end for him because it's just, I don't know, that's a level of, I understand if you don't understand trademarks and copywriting and you know okay that maybe that's not your job and, and maybe we should have watched that a little bit better but when you google hell's angels and then import it into your photoshop and right. then change <laughs> the words you know that you're stealing right. you know and it's like it doesn't matter if that means i'm gonna get beat up or you're stealing like a corporate company's logo who could really do damage financially and really hurt you know really do real damage that's just so such common sense and so I don't know. I, I give a lot of leeway on like, oh, well, that wasn't your job. And, and, and I get it. We should have checked. But that's pretty next level, just theft. And you stole from the exact wrong people. You know, you have to be careful for all of you who are listening to this. And maybe you're just, you know, working on a company logo or something because, you know, this happens in our world too. A year ago, all of a sudden I start getting hit up by this guy on Instagram 
telling me that I stole his logo. And I go to his Instagram profile and he has my self-made man logo with the name changed on the little ribbon that we have across the middle. And he's all accusing me of stealing their logo and he's going to sue me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just like, what in the world is going on here? And yeah. three or four years ago, I had the logo made from scratch out of my head onto paper and, and had a designer translate. So I knew that it was legitimately our logo and that they had in fact stolen it. And so I yep. told him that and I said, hey, go back to your designer and ask him where he got it. And he did. And it was some guy overseas who stole our logo and photoshopped his name onto our logo. And, you know, luckily yeah. the, the kid saw that and apologized and whatnot. But it happens more often than you think. So be super, super Yeah, Yeah. And, and people, yeah. And to the listener, you know, the, the harsh reality that hopefully we can save you from maybe at least a few of you is like, People like to think like, oh, this was my idea. So the world knows this is my idea and everything is supposed to play out fair. And I think we're both here to tell you that that is exactly the opposite. And there are people that lots of them in every country of the world that see something happening or bubbling or catch wind of something that could potentially be something and they go trademark it first or they try to you know, they try to beat you to it or they try to find ways that you'll slip up or different variations of what your brand is. Or I mean, people will try everything. And that's a huge lesson that I learned. It, it happened to us a couple of times and it cost us some money here and there. But, um, you know, even going around, like I said, going around the whole world and searching the Young and Reckless trademark and, and seeing what was going on. Because, you know, if your brand explodes and maybe you have the opportunity to become big in China or big in Australia, but somebody watched your TV show and went and trademarked it before you, you know, and there's nothing you can do. There's no fairness law to really protect you, you know, other than a couple small ones. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Good. What are, um, we've yeah. got a few minutes left. What are, what are some of the other lessons learned the hard way that you could share with folks real quick? And it, it can be in, in business. It can be personally, it can be money. It can be relationships. Uh, anything that you think was a turning point in your life that you would uh, want others to benefit from? You know, I think in general, I've been really fortunate. And I think that, uh, you know, naturally, I'm sort of, I'm a pretty quiet, hardworking, ambitious guy. You know, like I kind of have this natural stuff that's kept me on track quite a bit. And I'm very lucky for that, wherever that comes from. And, and I would just say to sort of blanket everything that's happened, you know, negatively or lessons learned, it's really about sort of calming down auditing yourself frequently, seeing what you're really doing, learning how to be like harsh, 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 realistic with yourself and really educating yourself on all of the different aspects of your business. I think I've seen so many people fail simply by getting ahead of themselves or having these high expectations or starting to think that they deserve something that they don't. And I would say the majority of my uh, failures or slip ups other than the casual ones have been from that. Like, you know, you, you do good. And so you think you don't have to sort of answer to these things, these certain things anymore. You don't have to worry about that or this will just work out your way. And almost always when you just kind of rush and feel like you know it all, you're leaving a lot of gaps open for, for problems. And, and that's just what I can't stress enough is like, I get it. You have a good idea. You feel good about yourself. People like your brand, but just calm down for a second. Make sure you're covering all your bases and, you know, you're moving forward in a, in sort of a, a more sound way, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Chris, this has been a, an absolutely fantastic call. Thank you so much for the time today. I've, I've learned a ton and, uh, I think you've brought a lot of wisdom to the table when it comes to, you know, essentially building a brand in today's, uh, today's environment. Where can folks go to connect with you, uh, connect with the brand, maybe pick up a couple of pieces of clothes? Yeah. Let me say too quickly. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I hope we added some value to like somebody's life. And, and I think that sometimes I like to talk about like the harsh realities and how hard things actually are. But let me sort of also cap it with saying that it's all worth it. Like 1 million percent, it's all worth it. And that's kind of my goal is to show people how worth it it is, show the hard work that goes into it and say, this is the, this is the harsh reality of what it takes. But man, if you do it, it, the payoff is just insane. And the ability, I'm sure, as you know, to be able to sort of design your own life and do what you want to a degree, 
there's just no feeling like just even that those small wins and that achievement and there is just no feeling you know i just want to cap it off by saying like he, you know this is the lessons i've learned these are the things i've been through but man is it worth it if you uh, if you do it right as far as finding me clothing is all on young and a lot of cool stuff there we've really worked hard to make these full collections and get our prices right and just I mean, i'm really proud of where it's came and then podcast is short story long itunes soundcloud all the places for that and my main social media that i really engage in is instagram which is just drama cool yeah oh, that's yeah that's uh obviously your nickname back back from the day in the shows but that's pretty pretty badass that you were able to get that on insta it is i got it man talk <laughs> about trademarks and stealing and taking stuff from people i got it <laughs> I'm, uh, i've been working on that with self-made man for a year and a half now we're getting there we're making progress. yeah man yeah. You, you just get to that point like once you get to the point and instagram sees that it's more worth it for you to have it than for them to have it you got it yeah, the world isn't always fair. You know? Well, it's you know it's interesting. the The Twitter and the and the Instagram accounts are not being used, and and we are just waiting for the USPTO to send our official trademark certificate over, and at yep. which point we can have to then send to them to get assigned. But um, yeah, it's part of the process, part of the journey. <laughs> yeah, I think you're looking good, man. That's the, yeah, that's that's all you got to you know. If, like I said, it's all about to them. It's like it's more valuable for us to have the real one here than it is this guy doing nothing and and sure enough it's all yours yeah absolutely well this has been awesome brother thank you so much uh i've learned a ton yeah and i really appreciate it absolutely uh and as always ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for listening and uh if you found value in this interview as i did uh, we'd love it if you could share it with your friends and family as well and make sure you go check out young and reckless well chris thank you so much and um we'll see you next week take care Don't burn it.